In Golden, Colorado's Bradford Washburn American Mountaineering Museum, you will find an old ice axe with a story to tell. A picture of it right there. An ice axe is an implement that mountain climbers always carry with them. They use it sort of like a walking stick when they're just on fairly level ground. Uh, but the minute they start to fall, they, they do a, a tactic called a self-arrest, which means that you flop down on the snow and dig the axe in to break your fall. And then the axe can also be used as a, as a, hard, as a, a firm point if you dig it into the snow. So it's a multi-use tool that every climber has. And this particular ice axe has an amazing story that has been called the Miracle Belay. The ice axe belonged to a 26-year-old climber named Pete Schoening. He was part of a 1953 expedition that was attempting to climb the hardest mountain in the world, not Mount Everest, but the mountain called K2, which is almost as tall and far more difficult with much worse weather. Well, anyway, as they were climbing the mountain, when they got somewhere above 25,000 feet, trouble struck the team. One of the climbers uh, came down with uh, high altitude sickness and was completely incapacitated. So they turned around and tried to begin getting uh, their fellow climber down the mountain. As they did, they were using a whole series of, of rope connections, tow lines and tie-offs, because they had this man in a, basically in like a little sled or whatever, and they were trying to lower him down while the rest of them all climbed down. If you know anything about mountain climbing, going down is worse than going up. So then while they were in the middle of attempting this, this maneuver, they had to cross an ice sheet. They had to kind of scurry across or traverse it. And while they were doing that, one of the climbers lost his footing. He fell into the rope of another climber, knocking that climber off the mountain. The two of them slid into some other climbers, knocked them off the mountain. And within just a matter of a couple of, a couple of seconds, five of the climbers were all hurtling to certain death down the face of K2. The only climber who wasn't falling was Pete Schoening. He saw what was happening. He was the one that was upstream from all the rest of them. He wound the line connecting him to them around his shoulders, plunged that ice axe deep into the snow behind a rock, and just held on for dear life. The full weight of all five climbers snapped against the line. Miraculously, the rope didn't break. The ice axe held. And with that one action, Pete Schoening saved the lives of his entire team. Each one of us is climbing a mountain. It's higher. It's more dangerous than anything you could have ever imagined. It's more complicated. It has more twists and turns. It has crazy weather. Uh, we run out of things. All sorts of stuff happened on this journey we call life that began at the bottom of a picture of a figurative mountain. And as we climb it, we are trying to attain that thing that God called us to be and called us to do. We all begin with high hopes. Surely, we'll be successful. Surely, we'll stand on the summit and wave our flag. Weren't we made for this? But along the way, things always go wrong. We make mistakes. Our pride and our fear cloud our judgment like a storm coming in over the mountainside. We aren't as good as we thought we were. Weather turns bad, an avalanche roars through camp, sweeping away our supplies. We find ourselves traversing an ice sheet, roped to our com comrades. Somebody slips, and we all begun, begin tumbling out of control down the mountain. And every once in a while, when we're in those moments, we wonder, is this the way it ends? Is this all there was going to be? We've all been there. We thought things were going along OK when disaster strikes. Perhaps a spouse dropped those dreaded words, I want a divorce. And out of the blue, we find ourselves falling, all of our hopes for family and marriage slipping away. Perhaps we were unfaithful to our marriage vows, unleash an avalanche of hurt and pain. Might be that we just become lost in a snowstorm of addiction with no idea of how to move forward. Or it may simply be the circumstances beyond our control move in like a nasty weather front and shut us down. We might lose a loved one and lose all sense of what we were doing in this life and where, what our purpose would be. Whatever the case, we need a savior. We need someone like a Pete Schoening on the other end of the rope who will not let go. 
Now, Paul knew exactly whom to rely on. He wrote these words to the Romans in, Re in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the good news. It's God's power, bringing salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and equally to the Greek. No shame in the gospel. Those words are easy for us to say. They were an absolute, absolute contradictory sort of thing for Paul to say in his time. No shame in a Messiah figure that the Romans put to death on a cross in the most shameful way possible with a sign over his head mocking him and saying, King of the Jews, people spitting on him, people mocking him, people mistreating him in every possible way. An entire society, an entire empire saying that he was the most shameful thing on the planet on that particular day. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Anybody listening would have said, the what news? The good news? The good news that he was beaten to within an inch of his life and put on a cross and bled to death? Had a spear stuck in his side? Was written off as a heretic? Was written off as a traitor? Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Because in that, actually, there is good news. The cross wasn't the end of the story. The cross merely set the stage for the greatest demonstration of God's power that the world has ever seen, the resurrection of Jesus. Because when all hope was lost and Jesus had been dead for three days, God's power broke through. The angel rolled away the stone and the Holy Spirit breathed life into the battered corpse of Jesus. Jesus walked out of that tomb. He was raised from the dead to become king of God's world. And that same power is here right now for you and for me. Every time you encounter this good news, God is saying, I'm here to rescue you. In your situation, in the place where your climb has gone sour, in that place where you're sliding out of control, or where the weather has socked in and you don't know your way, or where you've lost a friend or a loved one or a mate and you don't know exactly how you can go another step, or where you have that health concern, or you have that concern about your child, or that concern about your own future, or even about your finances, and you just say, it just doesn't make sense. I can't do this anymore. I'm not sure how to move forward. Right there, the good news is that the same power that could raise Jesus out of a tomb is there to be for you right now. It doesn't matter how lost you are. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. Jesus promises to be on the other end of the rope. All you have to do is put 100% trust in him. Now, the miracle belay on K2 didn't just happen. It was made possible by something that happened long before a single climber had put one foot on that mountain. The mountaineers, the team, had entered into a sacred pact in which they committed themselves. You could say they covenanted themselves to lay their lives on the line for each other. They agreed to function as a team. They agreed to be there in, in a buddy system and also as a complete team together. And this wasn't just a, a, a promise. This wasn't just an ideal. This wasn't just something like, I got your back, bro. It wasn't that type of thing. No, they made it real because they hooked a rope from one to the other. Whatever happened at one end of the rope was going to happen very quickly at the other end of the rope. That's a covenant. That's a covenant. That's not just a promise. That's not, not, not just a fair weather, hey, let's take a few pictures here when we get to that rock up there. That's talking about whatever happens to you happens to me. And that's exactly what Pete Schoening did high up on the slopes of K2 when that disaster struck. When his entire team began plunging to certain death. Imagine that. Every single person in his team was dying at that moment. He remained faithful to that sacred pact. He did the right thing. Now, Paul says that that's what God has done for you and for me and will always do for you and for me. If we go to the next verse, Romans 1, verse 17, it reads like this. This is because, he says, I'm not ashamed of God's good news. It's the power of God. How can I say such a crazy thing? He says, because God's covenant justice is unveiled in the gospel. From faithfulness to faithfulness, as it says in the Bible, the just shall live by faith. At humanity's darkest moment, 
and greatest failure, the crucifying of God's own son. When human beings put to death the Lord Jesus, God unveiled not his wrath, not his anger, but instead he unveiled his love and his commitment to rescue us through the death of his son Jesus and through Jesus' resurrection. It was that, it took that disaster to show just how great God's love was. Take it back to Pete Shoning. Great guy, 26 years old, lots of aspirations, climbs mountains, wants to do it for his whole life, kind of guy you want on your team. But you never knew how solid Pete Shoning was until five of his team members were all sliding to certain death. And he said, not on my watch. Then you found out how right he was, how righteous he was to their agreement, how faithful he was to their covenant. It took a disaster, almost, to show how faithful that climber was. It took the cross to show us how faithful God is. When everything went wrong, and when we didn't deserve to be rescued, when God could have pulled out his knife and said, sayonara, you're done. I don't want to deal with you anymore. Instead, Jesus took the full shock and the full weight of our fall. That's what Paul means when he says God's covenant justice, his righteousness is revealed. The more traditional translation of this verse does put it with the word righteousness. It says, Romans 7, 117a in the NIV, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So what does that mean? What is God's righteousness? Well, it's not just saying that God never does anything wrong. <clears throat> it has more to do with this agreement, this covenant being roped together. God's righteousness refers to the fact that God is faithful to his promises. He always does the right thing to maintain his end of the bargain. He never, never lets us down. It refers to the fact that God will be a righteous judge when it comes to making things right in his creation. The translation covenant justice helps us keep the focus on God's righteousness as God's faithful commitment to his covenant promises. God makes a promise to you when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus. He says, I, through Jesus, will be on the other end of that rope for you all of your life, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what is done to you, no matter what you do. If you will just stay tied into me, I will be faithful. That's God's righteousness, his righteousness. That's what he looks like. That's how he acts. Now, again, Pete Schoening displayed this kind of righteousness when he saved his fellow climbers. He did the right thing. He remained true to the promise to do everything in his power to protect them, even if it cost him everything. And Jesus did this for you and me when he died on the cross. It was at that moment that God's eternal covenant faithfulness and justice, God's righteousness, was unveiled for the whole world to see. I'm sure Paul had in the back of his mind when he used the word unveiled, the fact that at the moment Jesus died in the temple where God's presence was meant to be, the veil that separated the presence of God from the rest of the world was torn in half. Sort of a physical acting out of what Paul said was happening in a cosmic way. God's faithfulness was being unveiled. It was there for all to see. You could never, ever not say God was faithful. God's righteousness revealed. Now, every time you and I encounter the good news, God reveals this righteousness and faithfulness in his covenant to us. He wants to do for you what Jesus did on the cross for those who saw him and put their faith in him years ago. He's with you on this climb. As we climb the mountain, Jesus himself offers to be our guide. I don't know if you've ever done a complicated mountain climb, uh, something beyond a hike. When you put on the crampons and you have the, the, you're roped up and you've got the harness on and the helmet and the whole deal, uh, and you're climbing something you don't really know how to climb, there's somebody in front of you all the time. Well, you know what they do is they go up the mountain. If it gets steep, they kick steps into the snow. And everybody takes the same steps. If it's icy, they chop steps with their ice axe so that everybody is in the same steps. As they go up, they make sure that the rope is secure. They will climb, and then they'll tie it off on, on some sort of uh, protection. And then they'll bring you up. 
And so that you do this climb together. And that's what Jesus wants to do with you and with me in our life climb. Oh, there'll be times when we're walking along and just swinging the rope. It's just there for fun because we're on a flat place. The sun's out. It's a beautiful day. Our biggest problem is we don't want to get some sunburn. But then there are those times when the weather comes in and we can't see past our nose. All we can see is this rope going off into the fog. And who's on the other end of the rope? Give it a little tug. And you'll hear a voice say, yeah, I'm here. I got you. And then when we don't know where to put our steps, we don't, know what to, don't want to put a foot down and then slide to our death or to ruin, we find that steps have been cut for us. He's right there. You may not always see him. He may be just around the corner. He may be up in that cloud that you're climbing into. You may not be able to hear him. The wind may be howling. The snow may be blinding you. But you've got the rope. The Bible has a name for that rope. It's called faith. Paul says in this amazing verse, he says that God's justice is revealed from faithfulness to faithfulness. From faith to faith. What's that mean? From faith to faith. Well, what it means is from one end of the rope to the other end of the rope. God is faithful. Jesus is faithful to his end of this bargain, of this covenant. And because of that, I can choose to be faithful, to trust him and keep that rope tied around my waist and saying, I'm going to trust him in every step of the way. From faith, God's faith, to my faith, my trusting him. You see, verse 17a, this is because God's covenant justice is unveiled in the gospel from faithfulness to faithfulness. God is faithful in Jesus. We're called to be faithful. That's where the other end of the rope comes in. We're called to stay tied in no matter what. We're called to follow Jesus' steps up the mountain. We're called to trust him to be there for us when we slip and fall. Now, all along our life journey, there are times when we think we have a better idea than the guide. Any else, anybody else been there? I have. You know, there we are, and the Lord says, okay, we're going up that little route right up there, and I'm going, I don't think so. Here, meet you at the, I see an easier way. Meet you up there, Lord. And what happens? It has never worked for me yet. Because I don't know the mountain. I don't know that what looks like an easier path actually is much more dangerous. Jesus knows the one way through that situation to get where we need to go. So being faithful means that I obey him, that I trust him. That I say, you know, sometimes I don't understand why we're going this way, Lord. Why do we have to go the steepest way today? Why couldn't we take that easy path? Well, I didn't know that there's an avalanche over there and that this way is safe. I didn't know what God was planning. Every one of us has been there. And you know, in response to that, you just have to trust him. He's climbed this mountain before. He's making footsteps for each one of us. Peter says that we follow in his steps. He's faithful. He'll never untie me. He'll never take me up some place where I'll be totally lost and then just slip off in the middle of the night and leave me there to die. He's promised to walk with me every step of the way. He's promised to walk with you every step of the way. Whatever you're dealing with in your life right now, he's got you. He's got you covered. That's God's faithfulness being unveiled. Unveiled in Jesus who walks with us each step of the way. Paul concludes this verse with a, a quote from the Old Testament. The last part of verse 17, he says, as it says in the Bible, the just shall live by faith. These words were originally written by an Old Testament prophet named Habakkuk. And they were written during terrible times for the Jewish people, times when every possible storm was hitting the mountain. Israel's enemies were on the march. All seemed lost. And how would God's people respond? What were they supposed to do? It looked like God had abandoned his promise. It looked like God had cut them loose. Maybe God was creating the avalanches that were coming down on them at that very moment. 
Would, they, would God be faithful in the coming trial? Or would he abandon them forever? That was the challenge. And the answer the Lord gives to his people is, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. In other words, keep trusting me. We're going to go through this storm together. We're going to survive it. We're going to come out on the other side. We're going to be above the clouds. You're going to see my promises come true. And you and I are called to do the same thing each and every day. We're called to remain roped up with Jesus as we climb life's mountain. Whether the going is easy or it's steep, whether it's dangerous, or whether it's just a time for a beautiful view, we're in a covenant with him. We're roped together. This is our sacred pact. All we need to do is trust him and follow in his steps. That is what God's righteousness looks like when it's unveiled in our lives. So get your stuff on and rope up with Jesus. It's a great day for a climb. We bow our heads together. Father, we need you more than we ever knew. We discover that in big and little ways with each twist and turn in our lives. And I just want to pray right now for anyone who is going through a hard place. If anyone is wondering whether you're on the other end of that rope. Lord, when they tug on it, that you'll tug back. They'll hear the voice of your Holy Spirit saying, hang on. We're going to get through this. We're going up above the clouds. We'll be on the summit. Just stay with me. Help them, Lord. Help them know. That what we feel at the moment, that what our brains tell us when everything is swirling, is not the whole story. And Lord, help those of us who are in a good place and saying, well, I don't really need any help with my life right now. I got this. Help us understand that we don't have this. We're on uncharted terrain. Sometimes we make our biggest mistakes when we think we can't fail. We need you, Lord. Help us be those people who are righteous because we live by faith. I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. And If you're in a situation like that, just listen very closely to what I have to say to you. This morning, you can come and you can pray with someone, or they can come and just pray with you where you are. And just ask the Lord to help you Retie that knot of faith that ropes you to him. You're never meant to do this alone. You're never meant to try to figure this out. Life isn't some sort of exam that we have to take and then hope God gives us a good grade. Jesus took it all. He said, no, 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 I knew you couldn't do it. I knew you couldn't climb this thing on your own. I knew you couldn't find your way. That's why I did it for you. And when you fall, when you fail... I take the slack. That's why I died on the cross for you. You know, the cross is our Isaacs, Jesus' Isaacs. It was at that point that Jesus took that cross and said, nope, all of the evil and brokenness and hurt and pain of this world stops here. It stops here. And my new life begins right here. That's what God has for you. So as we sing, I'm going to ask if our prayer team folks would come down, any elders that are here and uh, ministry leaders, come on down. And uh, we'd like to pray with you. If you want to pray where you are, maybe just catch somebody's eye. and A prayer team, just go to where they are. You can just kind of wave a little hand at them, do whatever you have to do. But let's make this time a time of making sure we're roped up with Jesus. Let's sing together. <laughs>